Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today is day eight in our 90-day SAT preparation series. So we're going to start with the math section today. So we're going to start with math no calculator. So we're going to spend we're going to spend about uh, 15 minutes with the math no calculator, and then we're going to switch to the math with the calculator. Spend 15 minutes there, and then we'll transition into the SAT writing section for that last half an hour. So we're going to be doing problems one through eight of SAT practice test two on the math no calculator section, and then problems one through eight on the math with calculator section of SAT practice test two. So as I go through, I'm going to tell you what to put in your notebook and what to put in your workbook. So if I see any tips or strategies that I would use for certain question types or certain setups or patterns on the math section, I'll tell you to put those in your notebook. And everything that I don't say to put in your notebook can just go in your workbook so you get practice doing these problems. So let's go ahead and get started with question one. If 5x plus 6 equals 10, what is the value of 10x plus 3? So once again, we see that we have to pay attention to what our end question is, right? Because if we solve for x, whatever x is will probably be an answer choice, but that's incorrect because we need to say what 10x plus 3 is. All right, the next thing that I see is I see I have 5x here and I have 10x here. So what I'm going to look to do is I'm going to look to double my equation. So by doubling my equation, I multiply all of 5x plus 6 equals 10. I multiply all of it by 2, right? So now I end with 10x and then 6 plus or 6 times 2, right, which is 12. So 10x plus 12 equals 10 times 2, which is 20. So why did I do that? Because now I have 10x here and I have 10x here. So now I'm asked for 10x plus 3. So to get to 10x plus 3, I'm going to subtract 9 from each side. Or I'm sorry, that should not be 0. That should be plus 3, right? So I've got now 10x plus 3. And then that's going to equal 20 minus 9, which is 11. So the value of 10x plus 3 then is 11, which is answer choice C. All right, so tips to put in your notebook for that. The big thing for your notebook is this right here. If we see that we have a uh, factor or a um, pretty much anything that can be multiplied by a number, right? So any factors of 10, if we have a factor of 10, that's gonna be five and two, right? So if we have factors, we're gonna look to double or triple or quadruple or multiply or divide by a number to get to that 10X, right, from 5X. So that would be one tip or strategy you can put in your notes is try to double or triple or half or one quarter any problem instead of solving for X if that can get you to your answer quicker. So right there, if you can recognize that 5x times 2 is 10x, we're going to want to go ahead and double that first equation to get to 10x, and then we'll solve for that plus 3 after that. And that'll save us time, because otherwise, we have to go through, we have to solve for x, then plug x back in, and that's going to take us more time than if we just double the equation to get to 10x. So that's the big thing there that you can put in your notes as far as strategy goes and a tip. All right, so now we got number 2. So this is that column, right? We have columns of equations. So when we see them stacked, Ordinarily, the question will ask something where if we can uh, we can do a plus or a minus here in order to find our answer. In this case, we'll see if it applies. Which of the following ordered pairs x, y satisfies the system of equations above? So we'd be looking to solve, but what I'm going to actually do right off the bat is I always want to get rid of wrong answer choices as quickly as I can. So one thing that jumps out to me right away is that the x plus y equals 0. So because of that, then I know that my x and my y, they can't both be positive and, or both be negative. They have to be different right? And they have to be equal, right? So one has to be an equal positive and one has to be an equal negative in order to equal zero because two minus two would equal zero. We see that. But if they were both, uh, if they were both positive, it'd be two plus two equals four. Or if they're both negative, it'd be negative two minus negative two equals negative four. So we know that they have to be the same number. One has to be positive, one has to be negative. So that means I can get rid of A and that means that I can get rid of D. So now I'm just left with B and C. And the next thing I'm going to do to go ahead and solve really quickly is I'm just going to pick one. And in this case, I'm just going to substitute it in, right? So I'll put 2 in for x. That's going to give me 3 times 2 is 6. So then 6 minus 2 times what is 10? Well, it's going to have to be another negative in order for us to increase to get to 10. So y then is going to have to be that negative 2. So therefore, my answer has to be answer choice B. So 2, the answer is going to be B. Big thing here is getting rid of wrong answer choices as soon as we can. So when we saw that x plus y equals 0, we could go ahead and get rid of A and we can get rid of D. And at that point, we were between 2. And for this particular equation, the best or the best way or fastest way in my opinion was to go ahead and substitute that x in to find our answer. So substituting in generally is a bad idea when you're working with all four. Just go ahead and substituting each each uh, answer choice out of a through d. But if you can get it down to two very quickly and it's an easy problem to substitute in like this is where you just have an x, a y, and then a constant, then substituting in can be a quick way to find the correct answer. So I wouldn't recommend substituting in your answer choices when you have a through d left, but if you're down to two, it can be a quick way to get to your answer. So you could put that, that tip there that I just said in your notebook if you would like. If not, that's okay. It's up to you on that one. 
So now we've got question three. A landscaping company estimates the price of a job in dollars using the expression 60 plus 12 NH, where N is the number of landscapers who will be working and H is the total number of hours the job will take using N landscapers. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the number 12 in the expression? Well, if we think about it, we can ignore the 60 because that's just our initial cost and we're not considering that. We're asked for the interpretation of number 12. Well, 12 gets multiplied by our number of landscapers times however many hours they work. So that's going to be how much each landscaper works or how much each landscaper is paid per hour that they work. All right. So that's going to be, let's look at our answer choices. We have A, the company charges $12 for each landscaper. That is correct, per hour for each landscaper. B, a minimum of 12 landscapers will work on each job. That is incorrect. There is no minimum. Uh, C, that the price of every job increases by $12 every hour. No, it increases by $12 per hour for each landscaper. All right, and that's answer choice A. So we can get rid of C, and then D, each landscaper works 12 hours a day. Never says that, so we can get rid of that. All right, question four. Which of the following is equivalent to the expression shown above? Well, if we look at this, what we need to remember is that we have our patterns of equations. So if we think back, we've got our x plus y squared, and that's what I'm looking at right here. Our x plus y squared is going to equal our x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. So immediately when I see that I'm asked to find the equivalent of uh, an equivalent expression, I'm thinking about my pattern. So I'd be thinking about that pattern. I'd be thinking about this pattern, right? Our x minus y squared equals x squared minus 2xy and then plus y squared. And I'd be thinking about our x minus y times our x plus y. That's a 4, but switch it to a y real quick, right? And then that one is going to equal an x squared minus y squared. So whenever I'm asked to find an equivalent expression to something like this, I'm going to go ahead and think about these patterns and find which one applies. So right here, immediately I see I have a plus sign right here. So that means I'm looking at this right here. And I also know that because I have an exponent of 4 here and an exponent of 2 and 2 here. So I know that I'm looking not at this one. I can get rid of that immediately because it has a middle term here and there's no middle term in this equation. And then right here I can get rid of that one because I have that minus sign. So I know I'm looking at this pattern here. So now that I know that, I'm looking at my first term, 9a, 9a to the power of 4, and I'm going to square root that. So 9a to the fourth power, when I square root that, that is going to give me 3a squared. So I know my answer has to start with 3a squared. I see in a we have 3a squared plus 2b squared, and I can check my last term as well. If we have 2b squared uh, squared, that is going to give us 2b squared squared. That's going to give us 4b to the fourth, right? That's going to be our last term. Middle term then is going to be that 3a squared times 2b squared times 2 because we have 2xy, remember? So that's going to give us a 12a squared b squared as well. So that's a quick way to check your work as well. Big thing here is if you're, you put this in your notes, if you're asked to find an equivalent expression to 1, make sure that we look for patterns. So we're looking at our difference of squares. We're looking at our uh, positive trinomial, our negative trinomial perfect squares rule. We're looking at the patterns that we put in our equations notes from last week. So that's the big thing there. When solving for equivalent expressions, make sure you look for patterns. The patterns are going to be really helpful there. So make sure you have those patterns memorized. It'll help you find the right answer much quicker. All right, next question. We've got question five. If k is greater than zero, which to me, I always think just if k is positive, if it's greater than zero, and x equals seven in the equation above, so I'll go ahead and substitute in seven for x, what is the value of k? So keep in mind, we're just solving for k. There's no trick there. It's not 2k plus 7 or anything. Just solving for k. All right, so I'm going to add 7 to each side then, right? Add 7 to each side. So now I've got 7 is equal to the square root of 2k squared plus 17. So the big thing here is I want to get rid of my square root. Now there's only one way I can do that, and that's going to be squaring each side. When I square each side, 7 squared is 49. So now I have 49 equals 2k squared plus 17. I'm going to subtract 17 from each side so I can isolate my k. Subtract 17 from each side. So now I'm isolating my k. I have 2k squared. I've got to divide each side by 2 to isolate k even more. 32 over 2 is 16. So now I have k squared equals 16. So now I have to take the square root of each side. Now this is where that k being positive comes in because the root of k squared is k. So k has to equal the square root of 16, which is positive uh, positive 4 and also negative 4, but k has to be positive since it's greater than 0. Therefore, k must equal 4. So my answer is going to be C. 
So the big thing there that I would put in your notes is pay attention to any uh, if statements. So any if k is greater than zero, really any if statement at all should be circled, underlined, or squared when you're reading through your question. Um, the next note that I would have would just be if you have a, a square root set equal to a number and you have to solve for what's underneath that square root, just make sure that you're uh, raising it to whatever power it is. So if it's a square root, raise it to the power of two. If it's the third root, raise it to the power of three. So those are the big things there for your notes, but really just make sure you're paying attention to those if statements. That's a big, big, big thing on the SAT math section. All right, question six. In the XY plane above line, L is parallel to line K. What is the value of P? Okay, well, what do we know about lines that are parallel? I said this last week in our math equations video. So if you haven't watched that, make sure you go watch that. Well, if the lines are parallel, that means that they have the same slope, right? So that's the same rise over runs. So they have equal rise over runs. So now let's go ahead and take a look at that. We've got line L. Line L we have all the points for, so let's find the slope of that. We see we go from negative 5 to 0, so that's a run of 5. And we see we go from 0 up to 2, so that's a rise of 2. Right? So we rose 2 and we went over 5, so that's going to be our slope. So this line here, K, it also has to have that same slope. So we've got 0 and negative 4 to P and 0. Well, we can go ahead and find our rise. We rise from negative 4 to 0. So that's an increase of 4. So we know our rise is 4. So what does our run have to be? So that's what we got to determine here. So we're going from 0 to P. Well, if we rose by 4, then we can set that 4 that we rose equal to our slope, which is 2 fifths times whatever X is, right? Especially because we're starting at that 0. We don't have to consider where we're starting. We can just call it 0 since that's what it is. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have to multiply by the reciprocal like I was saying yesterday, right? If we have a fraction next to our variable and we have to solve for the variable, we have to multiply by the reciprocal. So we're going to multiply by 5 over 2. That's going to give us 1, so we can cancel that. We have to multiply this side by 5 over 2 now. 4 times 5 is 20. 20 over 2 is 10. So the answer there is going to be 10. So our answer is D. All right, moving on to question 7. So for, or for uh, notes on question 6, I would say... Uh, really just making sure that you know uh, parallel slopes are, are equal. So lines that are parallel, their slopes are equal, but you should already have that in your notes. So really nothing new for six. You should already have everything in your notes there. Question seven, we've got an exponents one. So we can recall back to our exponents equations that we touched on last week for this one. So if x to the power of a squared over x to the power of b squared equals x to the power of 16, x is greater than one and a plus b equals two, what is the value of a minus b? Well, any time that I see I'm given an A plus B in my, uh, in my question and an A minus B, I am thinking about this rule right here that I showed you briefly in that last question, that A minus B times A plus B equals A squared minus B squared. So I'm guessing that's probably going to have something to do with this question. Anytime I see those two things, that's what I'm thinking about. So let's look at our question. So we got to solve for A minus B, right, given that x to the power a squared over x to the power b squared equals x to the 16. So big thing I'm going to look at here, I see my bases are all the same. They're all x. So that means that I can take my a squared, do minus b squared since we're dividing, and set that equal to that 16. So now when I do that, I can go ahead and factor that, right? I can factor that, say that 16 is equal to an a minus b times an a plus b. But we're already told that a plus b is 2, right? We're already told a plus b is 2, so we can get rid of that. Now we can go ahead and divide each side by 2 to solve for a minus b. And we see that a minus b then will equal 8 because 16 over 2 is 8. So our answer for 7 will be answer choice A. So as far as tips for this one, really just making sure we know our exponents rule. If we know our exponents rule, then we can get to right here. And then after that, we got to make sure that we are recognizing that pattern there. So I put those patterns in your notes for your equations last week. Make sure you have those memorized because if you have that memorized, then this, this uh, problem becomes very, very easy. So... Big thing there is just memorizing your equations, understanding those. All right, question eight. We have an equation, Na equals 360. The measure A in degrees, so measure A in degrees, of an exterior angle of a regular polygon is related to the number of sides, N, of the polygon by the formula above. If the measure of the exterior angle of a regular polygon is greater than 50, what is the greatest number of sides it can have? All right, well, just one thing to note. The equation we covered with polygons last week was for the interior angle. This is for the exterior angle. You don't have to know the exterior angle equation, okay? But you do have to know the interior angle equation, which is in your notes. So don't worry about writing this down. I just wanted to point that out in case you were a bit confused. 
the equation we put down is for the interior angle. But here we're doing, dealing with the exterior angle. We need to know the greatest number of sides it can have. The number of sides is shown by n. The angle is a. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're told that our exterior angle of the polygon is greater than 50 degrees. So we're going to take this 360, set it equal to n times 50 degrees. We're going to divide each side by 50 degrees to solve for n. It's going to give us 1, and 360 divided by 50 degrees. We see that that's going to give us about 7.2, I believe. I don't have my calculator on me. Let me grab that real quick. I do believe that that's 7.2. I'm about 100% sure. Yeah, it is. Okay, so that's 7.2. So we know that our number sides then is going to have to equal what? What's the greatest number of sides it can have? Well, we need to understand whether or not we're going to have to go up or down. If we were to increase that angle, because it says it has to be greater than 50, so if we were to increase our denominator, we increase this, then we know that our, our, uh, our value over here, the 7.2, if we're dividing by a larger number, we know that that's going to drop down. So the largest number of sides it can have is going to be 7 then, right? Because we can only have a whole number of sides. So the answer there is going to be C for number 8. All right, so now we can go ahead and move on to the math with calculator section. As far as tips for uh, number 8 that should go in your notebook, really there's not, not anything big I'm seeing here. The I guess one big thing that I would put in your notebook would be this right here is the... Uh, the is greater than and is less than in word statements. In word problems, make sure you pay attention to words such as is greater than or is less than or is equal to. And then when you have to round them, make sure you understand which way to round based on the is greater to or is less than or is equal to statement because those will affect which way you need to round to get to your answer. So I would put that in your notebook. That is actually really important. So make sure you have that in your notes. And then with that, we'll move on to the math with calculator section. All right, let's get started with question number one on the math with calculator section of SAT practice test two here. So we have a musician has a new song available for downloading or streaming. The musician earns nine cents each time the song is downloaded and point, point 0.2 cents each time the song is streamed. Which of the following expressions represents the amount in dollars, and so not in cents, but in dollars, just like these were given up here, that the musician earns if the song is downloaded D times and streamed S times? Well, we know that he earns $0.09 each time it's downloaded, because it says downloaded as D, and then he also earns $0.002 uh, each time the song is streamed. So those are going to be summed to get his total that he earns. So that's going to be answer choice C for question number one. Any notes on one? Um, I don't really see any. The only thing that I would say is just uh, as you read the question, there's going to be some as we get into uh, questions that are further down in the SAT math section that are more difficult, where it can be helpful to, as you see, uh, usually it'll be with inequalities, to go ahead and put in terms that you see down here with the numbers as you read through the problem. So for example, a lot of times, as long as something starts with, uh, for example, downloaded, the variable that they'll give you is going to be D. And if it's like streamed like that, it'll be S. So sometimes as I read down through, if it's a large inequality problem, like you'll see in questions 20 through 30 sometimes, I will go ahead and write uh, write the, the uh, inequality as I, as I read through the word problem. So I don't have to go back through and look through it. But I'll explain that later on. So you don't have to write that down, but it could be helpful since you'll be taking a practice test in a few days here. So. All right, question two. A quality control manager at a factory selects seven light bulbs at random for inspection out of every 400 light bulbs produced. At this rate, how many light bulbs will be inspected if the factory produces 20,000 light bulbs? Okay, so here I have a big tip that I want to go in your notes. And that is anytime that you're dealing with ratios, which you are here, the important thing to do is to put your X on top. So here's what I mean by that. What I mean by that is this. So we've got seven light bulbs out of every 400 that are produced are inspected. We are asked to determine how many will be inspected out of 20,000 light bulbs that are produced. So I'm always going to make sure that my X, my variable goes up top. And this is what I want you to put in your notes. Put down. I'm about to give you a direct quote. I'm not going to write it all down, but my quote starts here. This needs to go in your notes. Quote begins now. Always put your variable in a ratios problem on top, end quote. So here's why we do that, because then we only have to do this. We only have to multiply each side by 20,000 to get rid of that. All right, we see we do that, and we have 7 times 20,000 over 400 equals x. Now, what if we were to put x on bottom? We can still find the answer, but it's going to take a lot longer, and I'll show you why here. We've got 400 over 7. Now, if I want to solve for x, I got to multiply by x. All right, so now I've got x up top, 
then I have to multiply by 7 to each side, and then I have, to I have to divide by 400. Do you see how much more work that is? That's a lot more work. So anytime we're dealing with a ratios or a fractions problem like this, we're going to always put our variable up top. So that's going to save you a lot, a lot of time. So make sure you have that in your notes. That is an absolutely great tip that I just gave you, and that needs to go in your notes because it'll save you a lot of time. And it can prevent you from making simple mistakes because you only have to do one step instead of three or four. So that's the big thing with number two. So I'll go ahead and plug that in my calculator then. So we have seven times 20,000. So we got seven times 20,000 divided by 400. And I believe that's 350 and it is, it is 350. So my answer there's gonna be B. Okay, next question is gonna be question number three. We've got one end of a spring is attached to a ceiling when an object of mass M kilograms is attached to the other end of the spring. The spring stretches to a length of L centimeters as shown in the equation above. What is M when L is 73? Well, right here, we just plug in 73 for L, and we solve for M then. So we have 73 equals 24 plus 3 and a half M. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract 24 from each side to isolate my M. Subtract 24 from each side. That's going to give me 49 is equal to 3 and a half M. I have to divide each side by 3 and a half to isolate M, get M all by itself. When I do that, I have 49 divided by three and a half. I plug that into my calculator and that will give me 14 as my answer. So 14 is gonna be my answer. So that's gonna be answer choice A. Okay, any tips for this question? Let's take a look here. So I did what I told you before as far as underlining my variables. So I underlined my variables as I went through the word problem and I underlined what my question was asking me at the end. I did that. And that's really all that there is to this one. This one's really just being able to do algebra, so I don't really have any big tips for them. For that one, that one should just go in your workbook. Really no notes on that one. Nothing we haven't already covered. Questions four and five refer to the following information. So questions like these, I don't think we've covered one like this, but you'll be given some information here and you'll have two or three questions that relate to it. So in these situations, I would recommend reading this. So we've got the amount of money a performer earns is directly proportional to the number of people attending the performance. So what does directly proportional mean? Directly proportional means it's going to be something like y equals a constant times x, right? So as x increases, y increases by a constant amount. So in this case, we see that our y is going to be $120. That's how much he's earning when eight people attend. So that's going to equal some constant times eight. So that constant is going to be how much each person has to pay to get in. So we're asked how much money the performer will earn when, well, when 20 people attend a performance. Well, we're going to go ahead and divide each side by 8 here, right? 120 over 8 is going to equal K. 128, 120 over 8, that is equal to 15. So then we would do 15 times 20 since there are 20 people attending. So we got $15 is how much it costs each person times 20 people. And we do that and that will give us $300. So our answer there is going to be C for number four. Another way that you could do this, if you recognize this right off the bat, is you saw eight people are attending. You saw that we're asked for how much uh, the performer will earn when 20 people attend. We know that eight times two and a half is going to give us 20. So then we could do 120 times two and a half. And if you know that off the top of your head, you know that that's 300. So that's another way you can do it as well, if, is if you're very good with fractions like that, you recognize eight people attending uh, made $120. Then we can set up our ratio, right? So we could set up a um, 8 over 120 must equal a 20, or I'm sorry, I just, let's do it like this. Let's do 120 over 8 is going to equal x over 20. Multiply each side by 20. Now you've got 20 times 120 over 8, and that would give you your answer as well. So that's another way that you can do that. You'll see if you plug that in your calculator, that's 300. So you can set it up as a fraction like that. That's actually a really good way to do it. So that's one way that I would definitely recommend doing it. Or you can do it this way. So I showed you both. Personally, if it were me, I would just look at the problem, see $120. See that that's when eight people attend. Now I'm asked for 20 people attending. I'd recognize that if I multiply eight by two and a half, I get to 20. I'd multiply 120 by two and a half, see that that's 300. So that's the same thing that I did down here with these ratios. I just did it in my head. So up to you on how you want to do it. I showed you both ways. I would, if, I, if it were me, I would recognize it off the top of my head. But if you can't do that, then what I would do is I would do this ratio thing here, actually. So I would set up 120 over eight is equal to X dollars over 20 people. Keep in mind, I put my X variable up top. So that way I had to do less work. So 
This is how I'd prefer you to set it up if you can't recognize it off the top of your head. That's the quickest way to do it. So if you don't want to use that way, you can do the solving for k and then plugging it in, but that way down there with the fractions is going to be the quickest. So you can put that in your notes if you'd like. Question five, the performer uses 43% of the money earned to pay the costs. So that's to pay costs involving and putting on each performance. The rest of the money earned is the performer's profit. All right. What is the profit the performer makes at a performance where eight people attend? Here's what we're going to do. We're not going to use what we solved for the amount of ticket. We're told eight people attend and we know he makes $120. So we're not going to redo any math there. We know he earns $120 then multiplied by however much he gets to keep his profit. Well, we know 43% of his money pays costs. So we have to multiply by one minus 0 0.43 because that one is all of the money, we subtract our costs and we're left with our profit. All right, so when we do that, we're gonna have 120 times 0 0.57, and that is gonna give us $68.40, I do believe. I'll plug it in my calculator just to double check, multiply it, and I will get 68.4, so that is correct. So C will be our answer there. The big tip there is if you don't know this already, when you're given a percent, and you need it as a decimal, you just do zero point and then whatever the percent is. If your percent is 100, then it's gonna be one. If your percent is 200, it'll just be two. So you can understand that as well. Understand that if you need to find the uh, the other part, so say that for in this example, we had 43% used to pay costs and you need to find the rest, then you have to do one minus 0 0.43. And that's gonna give you uh, that 0 0.57 that you have to multiply by your original amount. So you can put that in your notes if you'd like. Really, the big tip there would, uh, was really with number four, setting up that, that ratios problem to get to that answer faster. So that was the big, the big tip I'd have for four and five, is setting up that ratios to get to the answer quicker and recognizing that, that fraction there. All right, question six. Question six. We've got when four times the number x is added to 12, so that means 4x is added to 12, the result is 8, so we set it equal to 8. What number results when 2 times x, that's 2x, is added to 7? That's what we have to solve for. All right, so looking at this one, there's a couple ways we can do this. Uh, the way that I would do this one is I would actually just go ahead and instead of having this number here, instead of having that one, I'm actually just going to go ahead and solve for x. You can have it if you want. If you were to have it, you would end with 2x plus 6 equals 4, and then you could just go ahead and add 1 to each side. All right, that's going to give you... Uh, 6 plus, that's going to give you 2x plus 7, 2x plus 7, and that's going to give you plus 1 over here, 5. So that's a really quick way to do it. I would do that one if I were you. Uh, that's just quicker. So once again, making sure you're understanding how you can use ratios to find your answer very quickly. So I would do that. That's really the best way to do it. I take back what I was saying about going through and solving for x. That's going to take a lot longer here. I was just concerned with this 12 and the 7, but it looks like that went away pretty quickly. So yeah, I'm definitely going to recommend that you go ahead and take the half here. Don't even bother about finding for X. Make sure that you recognize if you've got 4X and a 2X, go ahead and double one or half one to get to your answer. It's going to be the best thing to do here. And really with any problem where you have a whole number. So for example, if you had a 6X plus something and you had a 3X plus something, so that's a 3X, that's what that's supposed to be. A 3X plus some number. Really, I think the best way on pretty much every single math problem at least in my opinion, is going to be to just go ahead and use the ratios to get to your answer. That's going to be faster, in my opinion. So that's what I would use if I were you to find your answer much, much faster. So I would put that in your notes. I don't think that, I think maybe 10% or less of the time, it's going to be quicker to do it the other way. But I think 90% of the time, using these ratios like I did here, is going to be the fastest way to get to your answer. So I'm going to recommend that. Put that in your notes, for sure. So the answer there is going to be B. All right, question seven. You've got y is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 8. I already recognize a pattern there. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. And you should recognize a pattern here as well. And if not, that's okay. We'll work on it and you'll recognize it later as we get more practice under our belt. The equation above represents a parabola in the xy plane. Which of the following equivalent forms of the equation displays the x-intercepts? So keep in mind that that is where this equation equals 0 of the parabola as constants or coefficients. So you might not understand what a coefficient or a constant is. So I'm going to explain that right now. All right, so a coefficient is a number in front of x. So any number in front of x is a coefficient, and any constant is a number such as 4 or 2. For example, these are, co these are constants right there, and this is a coefficient right there. All right, so now let's go ahead and get into our answer. So 
A big thing with the SAT math section is factoring. So being able to factor quickly is very important. So right here, we've got x squared minus 6x plus 8. So I know that to get to x squared, I can do x times x. And I know that to get to 8, a factor is uh, 4 and 2. 4 times 2 is going to give me 8. I also see I have minus 6x. So what that tells me is I have to have a minus 4 and a minus 2. So how did I know that? Well, I knew that I had 4 and 2 as factors of 8. I know that negative 4 times negative 2 can also give me 8. And I know it has to be negative 4 and negative 2 because this is a negative sign here. And then I have negative 6x. So that negative 6 is greater than, or I'm sorry, has a greater absolute value, right? It's lower than my negative 4. So I also have to have that negative 2 to get down there. So I see negative 4x plus negative 2x gives me that negative 6x. So that's how I factored that very quickly. And those are going to be my zeros, right? So my answer there is going to be D. Okay, moving on to, well, I'll go ahead and check if there's anything I want you to put in your notes on this one real quick. As long as you understand x-intercepts are where your parabola equals zero, like I set it, to e set it equal to zero there, that's something you need to have in your notes. If you understand what constants and coefficients are, you don't have to put it in your notes. But if you didn't know what a constant was or what a coefficient was, go ahead and put that in your notes. So you've got, that's going to be your coefficient, whatever this question mark is in front of x is your coefficient. And then your constants are going to be like your minus four right here your minus two, your plus eight. So if you don't have that in your notes, make sure you have it in your notes. So with that, we can go ahead and move on. Also, if you don't know factoring, uh, that's right here. I put that in your notes as well. So now we got question eight. In a video game, each player starts the game with K points and loses two points each time a task isn't completed. So we start with K, we lose two points each time a task is not completed, which I'm gonna represent as N. If a player who gains no additional points so he doesn't gain any points, and fails to complete 100 tasks, so that means n is 100, has a score of 200, so that means 200 is equal to k minus 2. He said that he failed tasks 100 times, so that n becomes 100. What is the value of k? So keep in mind, we just have to find k here, nothing that's going to trick us up at the end. So we got minus 2 times 100, that's minus 200, so I'll go ahead and add 200 to each side to solve for k. I add 200 to 200, and I see that my k then is going to equal 400. So my answer there is going to be D. So as far as tips for that question, I would say um, as you go through problems like these, as you get really past number 10, uh, word problems, it can be helpful to go ahead and write out your equations as you read through them so you don't have to read through twice. So if you want to put that in your notes, I'd recommend that. Once you get through, it's okay pretty much usually on 1 through 10. They're, they aren't too difficult with word problems, but once you get past 10, Usually it'll be about five or six or seven or eight lines on the word problems, in which case having to read through it twice is going to waste a lot of time. So in that case, I recommend going through and constructing your equations as you read. So I would be reading through, and as I'm doing that, I'm not looking at my pen and pencil. I'm just writing the equations as I read through, right? So that's something I would put in your notes. And with that, we are going to end our math section for today and switch over to the SAT writing section for today. All right, let's get started with the SAT writing section for today. So today is day eight out of our 90-day SAT preparation series. So we're going to go ahead and go back and we'll review what we learned last time in our SAT prep lessons for the writing section. So we'll spend five minutes reviewing what we learned last time, and then we'll get into what we're learning today. All right, so on day six, we started with correlative conjunctions. So these were words that are used to connect equally important ideas to a sentence's meaning. So examples we had were the words both and and because fast and small were both equally important to that sentence's meaning. Then we had either and or, because those are both equally important. So we had either play basketball or play baseball. We had both fast and small. Those were our examples there. Then I went through an examples list, right? So I had a full list of examples for the correlative conjunctions. So these are ones that I think you should know because I think they're the most likely to show up on an SAT practice test or the SAT itself. So we have both and and, we have either or, we have just as and so, we have neither nor, we have not only but also, at once and, no sooner than, if then, rather than, right? So I'd make sure that you know those. After that, I talked about being concise. So this is huge with the SAT writing section. Put another star by it because it's so important. We need to make sure that we are avoiding unnecessary repetition and avoiding redundancy. So if you've seen any of my SAT writing answer explanation videos, I talk big time about avoiding repetition and redundancy. So we need to make sure that we do not repeat information that's already been said. We need to make sure that we're using modifiers to avoid repeating the same word twice. 
So a good example that I had was with words that end one sentence and start another. If you end a sentence with a word, such as the fisherman, you don't want to start the next one with the fisherman. More than likely, what you'll see is you'll see an underline going all the way through that period and into the next sentence, and you'll be asked to combine them because we don't want to repeat two words back to back like that. That's just being uh, repetitive and redundant. So we don't want to do that. We talked about not being redundant. So that means we're not repeating the same ideas or concepts more than once. We want to make sure that we are very concise. We want to use precise word choice to get our point across, and we don't want to waste time or waste words. Then I talked about idioms. So idioms, what I my big tip for idioms is if you're a native English speaker, so you're from the United States or you speak uh, American English very well, you grew up in a home like that, I would recommend just thinking about what you would say naturally. So I put that right here, just what, what would you say? That's usually going to be your correct answer. Now, if you're a non-native uh, English speaker or you're from the UK, from the UK, you'll probably still do okay using what would you say. But if you're a non-native speaker and you're not super familiar with how uh, English is spoken, then one thing I would recommend is searching common SAT idioms on Google and studying them. So I also mentioned that Prep Scholar has an article. So if you're a non-native speaker, I'd also look up that article. It's called All the SAT Idioms You Need. And I would go through their list of idioms to just to make sure that you're familiar with them. You don't have to memorize them because there's a lot, but being familiar with them will help you out. So the ones from practice tests were these four. So we had wait for, serve as, as a means of, and in order to be. So one thing I also talked about is for idioms, an indicator that's a, it's an India in oh man, an indicator that's an that it is an idiom question would be if there's a preposition, infinitive, or gerund that's underlined, right? So that would be something like for, something like as, as, or uh, in order to be, right? So in, so anything that's like that is going to be an indicator that you're probably dealing with an idiom question. In which case you just want to think about what in a a natural speaking, someone who's very fluent in American English would say, right? All right, so examples I had were regard as, worry about, and advise against, right? So you see that if you're, you've are you spoken English all your life, that's going to be kind of easy for you to identify. You'd say regard as when you're in a conversation, worry about, and advise against. All should be natural phrases you've said before. All right, so now we've got day eight. So we're going to get into what's new for today. What do you need to learn? So keep in mind, this stuff's still going in your notebook. We'll start doing some problems maybe within the next week. We'll see. Depends how much we get through and how much more we have to learn. But for now, we want to stay in our workbook for the writing section. Or I'm sorry, stay in our notebook for the writing section. All right, so today we're going to be learning about colons, m dashes, and apostrophes. So kind of a diverse topic set. Colons and m dashes are related, but apostrophes is just kind of tagged on here because I want to cover that today as well. All right, so colons, what are they? Well, colons... They look like this. I'll go ahead and show you. A colon is this thing, right? So it looks like that. That's how you'll see it. So colons, they must have an independent clause before it. So let's think back to what an independent clause is. An independent clause has a subject and a verb. So it's got a subject and a verb. All right, so example of an independent clause would be John ran today, right? That's an example of an independent clause or even John ran. That is technically an independent clause. We've got subject John, verb ran. So that's an independent clause as well. All right, so what comes uh, what comes before the colon is going to be an independent clause, so it's got to have a subject and a verb. So that's one rule. If it doesn't have an independent clause before it, you can't use a colon there. And then what comes after the colon? So this is where we get into the multiple functions of a colon. So what comes after the colon? Well, it can be examples, right? You can have a list that comes after a colon. Um, it can be an explanation or an illustration of the independent clause that came before it. So you can use a colon to connect two independent clauses. You can have an independent clause. I'll put that as IC, a colon, and then IC. But there is a clause to that, right? That is if your second independent clause, so your second independent clause, illustrates or explains. And I'm going to zoom in here so I don't get too far off here. Zoom in. That's if your second independent clause illustrates or explains, hang on, illustrates or explains, we are not switching here. Okay, there we go. Illustrates or explains the first independent clause, so your first independent clause. So if you're going to use two independent clauses and connect them with a colon, your second independent clause has to illustrate or explain the idea in the first independent clause. All right. 
So the functions of a colon, I got into that a little bit, but I'm going to get into it more in depth now. So the functions of a colon, why would we ever use a colon? Well, we're going to use a colon if we need to introduce a list. So an example of that would be in our second example here. We have John's swim, I should say John swims three days a week. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that real quick. Just give me one moment here. It's on my bad. I don't always have time to proofread these. But 90, if I ever make a mistake, I'll catch it mid, midway through and let you know. So it should say John swims. So there we go. We'll get rid of that. John swims three days a week. And then we have a colon, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. All right, so what is this colon doing in this, this sentence here? What it's doing is introducing that list. So we've got John swims three days a week. And then we list the days that he swims. So that's going to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So what would be an example of an error with this? So a common error you'll see with colons is students may know that it introduced a list, but then they'll do this. They'll do John, uh, we'll say John's favorite shoes are, and then they'll put a colon there, and then they'll list them, right? So they'd say Nike, uh, Brooks, and then I'm going to make up a brand just because I want to. And Venus. Let's say that the planet Venus was a shoe brand just because I felt like doing that. All right. So some students will do that. That's wrong. So why is it wrong? Well, let's look at what's before our colon. This is not an independent clause, right? John's favorite shoes are. That can't stand alone as a sentence. That's not an independent clause. Do we have a subject? Yes. Do we have a verb? Yes. But it's a sentence fragment. It's not an independent clause. All right, so John's favorite shoes are what? Well, we don't need, I'm going to put that back a minute. John's favorite shoes are, we don't need a colon here because we have this word are, right? This word are takes the place of this colon. So we don't want that there. We would just say John's favorite shoes are Nike, Brooks, and Venus. No need to put a colon there. So keep that in mind. If we're interrupting that, uh, that sentence to put that colon in, then we're doing it wrong. If we look back at our example over here, we see we have John swims three days a week. That can stand alone as its sentence. It's a full idea. Then we put in our colon and then we list the we list the days so keep in mind we don't have to put r in there or is or anything like that with that colon replaces that r or that is right okay our next point with a colon what's the next function next function is to connect two independent clauses when the second independent clause illustrates that first independent clause all right so if we have two independent clauses i'll go ahead and show you the example for that one the example that we have for two independent clauses is our first example so John runs on days that end in Y, which for the record is every day, and John runs on Mondays. So we see that those are each independent clauses because we have our subject John, our verb runs, our subject John, and our verb runs. And they're each full ideas. We have John runs on Mondays, that could stand alone as a simple sentence. We have John runs on days that end in Y, that could also stand alone as a simple sentence. So what we're doing is we're connecting them with that colon. So by connecting them with that colon, we're connecting our two independent clauses, and that second one is illustrating the first. So why is the second one illustrating the first? Well, John runs on days that end in Y. Okay, that's a full concept. So John running on days that end in Y. John runs on Mondays. Is Monday a day that ends in Y? Yes, so we're illustrating that first independent clause. So we always have to make sure if we're going to use a colon with two independent clauses that the second one is explaining or illustrating our first one. All right, so what's our next function of uh, colons? Next function is going to be emphasis. Now, keep in mind, a m dash, which I'm going to explain next. That's our next topic for today. An m dash is what I would prefer you use for emphasis. I think more often than not, an m dash is going to be better for emphasizing a uh, one word or multi word um, thing in a sentence. I think usually an m dash is going to work better. And I think the SAT and College Board would likely agree with me on that. I can't say for sure because I'm not associated with them. But as far as what I've seen on the SAT practice tests, I would prefer you use an m dash when doing emphasis because I think that there's a lot more ways that a colon could go wrong in doing emphasis than an m dash because m dashes are really versatile as i'm going to get into in a minute but with colons let's say that you did want to use it for emphasis an example would be john has one idea that has been stuck in his head for a week all right well we got subject john we've got his verb he has one idea that has been stuck in his head for a week all right so john has one idea that has been stuck in his head for a week that's our full independent clause and then we use a colon Right? And then we say what that idea was, reinventing the television. So we're using this colon here for emphasis. I'm going to put an E for emphasis, or I'll just write emphasis. Right? Reinventing the television. We see that this is not a full independent clause. 
that's just our uh, what John's idea is. So right here, we're just using it for emphasis. But more often than not, I would prefer that you use an M dash versus a, a colon for emphasis. All right, so moving on to an M dash then, let's get into what that is, right? Because I've ex touched on it. Well, what is it? M dash. An M dash serves three main purposes. And then we're going to get into each of the three below with an example. So an M dash, it looks like this. I'm going to go ahead and show you. Keep in mind what I put here is a hyphen, right? An M dash is longer. I just put a hyphen in because uh, there's really no way to put an M dash in from my keyboard. And I don't want to have to go back into the special characters list on Microsoft OneNote and try to find it because it takes a long time and I don't want to do it because I'm lazy. So an M dash looks like this. I'm going to put M dash there. So you know that's an M dash and a hyphen looks like this. So that thing on your keyboard that is to the left of that plus sign and that equal sign, that's a hyphen. And M dash is longer than that. And I don't think that they ever test you on if you can determine which is an M dash and which is a hyphen. I've never really seen that. I think that'd be a weird question. So just keep in mind an M dash is longer and a hyphen is shorter. So if I was going to really be strict on this, it would be John and then a long line and then a math teacher, right? Dot, dot, dot. But I just put in the hyphen because I didn't want to waste time going through and finding the M dash. So that's what an M dash is. It serves three main purposes. Purpose number one is indicating non-essential information. So you, you remember a while back when I talked about modifiers and how we can use commas to set off that non-essential information? Well, we can do the same thing with an M dash. So um, Johnny, math teacher. So right here we see we have our M dash after John and after teacher. So let's read through our sentence. We have John, a math teacher, will be running at the Boston Marathon on Tuesday. All right, so why is a math teacher non-essential? Because if we take out math, a math teacher, so let's cross it out a minute, will our sentence still make perfect sense? John will be running at the Boston Marathon on Tuesday. Yes, All right, so the answer to that is yes. It still makes perfect sense without it, which means that it's non-essential. Therefore, it must be set off with our M dashes right here. Okay, so we've covered that. So non-essential information, we can use M dashes to split it off from the rest of the sentence. So if your sentence makes sense without that information, then we need to set it off with either commas, M dashes, or parentheses, which I'm going to get into. See, it's down here. We'll get into that today as well. All right, so that's our first purpose of an M dash. What's our second purpose for an M dash? All right, so the second purpose is emphasis. And I would say that this is probably one of the most common purposes of an M dash. I would say it and non-essential information are the two big, big, the two big uses of M dashes. So an M dash for emphasis. What we're going to do is we're going to start uh, saying something. We're going to put in an M dash then, and we're going to say basically what the object or the uh, the person or place is of that big idea. So we've got there's only one Los Angeles Lakers player to trust with the last shot, right? So that's an independent clause on its own, but that's not really the important part. The big important part here is that we've said we've built up momentum in our sentence, right? If, if I was telling this to you, I said, there's only one Los Angeles Laker, Lakers player to trust with the last shot. You'd be thinking who, in which case I've built up emphasis now to my final point of Kobe Bryant, right? So you see, I've got my M dash here, right? Splitting off that big idea that needs emphasis from the rest of that sentence. So that's using an M dash for emphasis right there. Now, what about our final purpose? So our final purpose is less often than the other two. So this is the least often used purpose of an M dash, and that's abrupt changes in thought. So abrupt changes in thought would be you're saying something and then midway through you think, oh no, it's something else, right? And it's really abrupt and sudden and it changes momentum in the sense. It changes your, your thinking, it changes pathways. So if we're gonna look at this, we'd have an abrupt change in thought, an example. I should write an essay on Thanksgiving. So that's our first part. Then we have our M dash because all of a sudden we're like, oh no, we can't write an essay on Thanksgiving. No, we need to write it on business ethics, right? So we're changing ideas very quickly there. So when we're going to change ideas like that, an abrupt change of thought, we're going to use an M dash to do so. Using a colon, like I said, it's not going to emphasize it as much as an M dash will, in my opinion. An M dash is going to really be used for the most emphasis you can get, which in this case, in an abrupt change of thought, you want the most emphasis possible. So we would say it like this. I should write an essay on Thanksgiving. No, on business ethics, right? So we're using that M dash to use that abrupt change in thought there. All right, so that covers our M dashes and our colons. You've seen the similarities and differences between the two. Now we can go ahead and get into apostrophes. All right, so apostrophes. 
we've got two types of apostrophes that we use. We use them to show possession and we use them for contractions. So we're going to cover possession first, right? So possessive apostrophes, what does that mean? Well, you've got two types of possessive. You have singular and plural. So what that means is if you have a singular person or object or thing or place, such as John, John is singular, we're going to use an apostrophe to show that it's John's car, right? So that apostrophe there shows that John owns that car. So since it doesn't end in S, so since it doesn't end in S, we add that apostrophe and the S because it doesn't end in S. Now, what if it ended in S? Let's say that it was, I'm trying to think of a name that ends in S a minute. Um, let's say that the full name here was Stevens, right? That's his whole name. Not Steven, but Stevens. This is his full name all the way to here, all the way, including the S. The S is included in his name. And we wanted to show that it's his car. Then we just add that S, that apostrophe after that S to show that it's his car. But keep in mind then, that full name there is Stevens. So not Steven, but Stevens is his full name. In that case, when, we're, when we end with an S in the name we're gonna or in the object, we're going to add that apostrophe on after the S, and then we're going to have our object after that. So an example for plural, if we have a plural object, so the Lakers, right, that's plural, we'd have the Lakers court. It's their court, right? So we've got the Lakers court. We see it ends in an S. We add that apostrophe to show possession, and then we have court. All right, so now we got contractions. So the next use of an apostrophe is going to be with contractions. So apostrophes and contractions. All right, so basically what this means is with a, uh, we're going to have two words. We're going to take out one letter, put in our apostrophe to make it into one word. All right, and if you're ever, well, I'm not going to say that. All right, so we've got it's. This is our example. First one, we've got it's. We know that that is it is. Why? How do we know that it is it is? Well, when we remove this I, we put in, an apostrophe and we leave the s so that i takes or i'm sorry that apostrophe takes place of our i and now we're left with its next we have there so that's going to be they are we remove our a remove our a and we put in our apostrophe to get there next up we have can't right so can't would be we are doing can not and this one's an interesting one because cannot is like one word but we still can use an apostrophe so it actually takes out two so I probably should have picked a different one that's more simple, but I guess it's good to know that one as well. So you see that contractions, you're taking out a letter in this can't cases too, but that's an exception to the rule. So really don't pay attention to that. I shouldn't have put that in there. Get rid of that. Pay attention. You see you take away one letter, put in an apostrophe, forming one word from two. That's a contraction. And that's how we use an apostrophe in that. So that's just something you need to keep in mind. All right, parentheses. So parentheses is the last thing that we're going to cover today, so we might end a little bit early, and that's perfectly fine. We're really running ahead of pace in the SAT writing section. I thought it was going to take a lot longer to cover this material, but we're moving pretty quickly, so it's okay if we finish a little bit early. All right, so we've got parentheses. Parentheses look like this. I typed them up. I'll handwrite them too. They look like that. They're used for non-essential information, at least as far as the SAT is concerned. So as far as the SAT is concerned, and as far as I know, it's used for non-essential information. So that means in our example, we would have John, the world's best heart surgeon, is going to vacation in Florida. So why do we use our parentheses? Well, we need to be able to identify the non-essential part of the information. So if we were to take out the world's best heart surgeon, would the sentence still be a full sentence and still make sense? Well, we have a subject, John, we have a verb, is, so we've got John is going to vacation in Florida. That is a full sentence and it's a full idea. Now, we don't need the world's best heart surgeon in there to make it a full sentence. We can remove it and the sentence still makes sense. Therefore, it is non-essential, right? It's not needed. Non-essential just means not needed, right? So John, the world's best heart surgeon, this is just telling us who John is, right? It's not needed. So we put it in parentheses. We also could have put it in M dashes, we also could have put it in commas. So all of those are appropriate uses to set off non-essential information. So if you want to put down in your notes non-essential information and put off, it can be set off by a parentheses. It can be set off by M dashes. And it can be set off by comma. Most often, it will be set off by comma. So I'm going to put that right here. I'm going to put a star and say most often. So most often, non-essential information will be set off with commas. 
uh, between em dashes and parentheses, I would say second most often you'll see on the SAT, in my opinion, I haven't done the numbers, but just from my experience taking all these practice tests, I would say second most often would be uh, em dashes, and I would say third most often would be parentheses. But all of them are appropriate uses. I don't think I've ever seen a question where you have to pick between all three of these. Usually it'll just be one. I don't think I've ever seen it be two, because if it were two, then that would be a bad question in my opinion. So really you just got to know that it can be any of those three. I don't think it'll ever show up where it's all three of them or two of them. It'll pretty much always, in my opinion, be just one of them. So you don't have to worry about that. So that is your lesson on parentheses for today. I'm going to give you a couple more uh, sentences here for practicing identifying what is non-essential in a sentence. And then after that, we're just going to be done. So we'll do two sentences identifying non-essential information here. So I'm going to make these up on the fly. Let's do Jason. Um, and I'm going to have you pick where to put the commas on this too. So I'm not going to put them in as I go. We're going to do Jason, a woolly mammoth. I don't know how to spell mammoth, so I'm going to do my best. Is going to play basketball. And I'm going to zoom out here in a minute so you can see the full sentence. All right, it's going to play basketball. So let's say that that is our sentence right there. So where would you put your commas? Let's say we're going to use commas to identify our non-essential information here. Where would you place them? I'll give you about 15 seconds to decide, and then I'm going to put in my answer. Okay, so we're going to place commas after Jason and after Woolly Mammoth because that is describing who Jason is. So why is that non-essential to the sentence? Well, just like with the world's best heart surgeon, it's just identifying who Jason is. He's a Woolly Mammoth. So Jason is going to play basketball. It's a full sentence on its own. A Woolly Mammoth is not needed there. So let's do another one. Let's say we've got, I'm going to try not to use a person here. Let's do this. The New York... Knicks, that's capital. Oops, uh, get rid of that. You're going to be identifying where the commas go. Uh, ignore what I just did there. Can't seem to fix it. Okay, there we go. All right, so the New York Knicks, a professional sports team. The New York Knicks, a professional sports team. have the third pick in the NBA draft. All right, so if you're going to place commas in this sentence, where would they go? Hang on a minute. All right. Ignore this other R in draft. I can't get it to go away, but there's two R's in draft here. There should only be one. I can't get it to go away. So just ignore that. All right, so where would you place the commas here? I'll give you about 15 seconds to answer that, and then we'll be all done. All right, so I should have put professional. should have said professional sports team, not profession sports team. But either way, commas should go after Knicks and then after team, right? Because if we were going to take out a professional sports team, we would have the New York Knicks have the third pick in the NBA draft. So we see that a professional sports team is not necessary to the meaning of the sentence. We still have a subject and a verb in our sentence, so it would still be a complete sentence, a complete idea. Therefore, we place commas or an M dash or a parentheses with a, a professional sports team. So. That's the end of the lesson for today. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and share. Uh, there will be a link for donations in the description box when it's up and running. Thanks for watching and make sure to have a great day.